Okay, I want to do today's video broadcast on Job chapter 8, and we're going to just read through, uh, through verse 8 through the in conclusion which is verse 22 and it says ask the former generations and find out what their ancestors learned for were they born only yesterday and know nothing and our days on earth are but a shadow will they not instruct you and tell you will they not bring forth words of their understanding can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh can reeds thrive without water whilst they are still growing and uncut they wither more quickly than grass such is the destiny of all those who forget god so perishes the hope of the godless what they trust in is fragile what they rely on is a spider's web they learn they lean on a web but it gives way they cling to it but it does not hold they are like a well-watered plant in the sunshine spreading its shoots over the garden it entwines its roots around a pile of rocks and it looks for a place among the stones but when it is torn from its spot that place disowns it and says i never saw you surely its life withers away and the soil of other plants grow surely god does not reject the one who's blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed with shame and the tent of, tents of the wicked will be no more. I find that a very interesting passage, the way he uses illustration from like uh, gardening to like prove a point. And you see throughout the scripture there is a lot of illustrations in scripture where plants and natural things within the natural world were used as objects lessons to teach about spiritual realities and Jesus did that oftentimes like the parable of the four soils and the farmer who sowed his seed in four different types of soil and some grew well one one type grew well but the ones the others did not take root really or mature or get to a point where they actually benefited the farmer at all the seeds some of them were trampled some of them grew in shallow soil and some of them were eaten by the birds along the path and so we see throughout scripture you know there are illustrations from even everyday ordinary life and i think this is a very interesting passage it talks about uh, how the wicked those who do not know god those who reject god do those who do not trust in god or put their confidence in god says while they are still growing and uncut they will wither more quickly than grass such is the destiny of all those who forget god so perishes the hope of the godless what they trust in is fragile what they rely on is a spider web so if you've ever tried to lean up against something you know that for its size a spider web is considerably strong but if you were to lean your weight against the spider web it would give way and you would fall flat on the ground and so the truth is, whatever we rely on that is not fully God, whatever we put our whole trust in that is not truly God, will give way eventually, and we will fall flat on our face. God is our only true anchor, our only true source of confidence that we can rely on. As it says in Jeremiah, uh, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And so when we are trusting in the Lord, that's Jeremiah 17, 9, I believe it is. Let's go take a look at it real quick. I think it's 17, 9. Let's just take a look just to verify that. And because uh, it's a really good verse to look at. Oh, it says, Jeremiah 17, 5 through, through, through 9. It says, this is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws his strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in parched places like the desert, in a salt land where there no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by waters that sends out its root by the streams. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green, it has no worries in the year of drought, and never fails to bear fruit. 
The heart is deceitful above all things, beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the search the heart, examine the mind, and reward each person according to what their con to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. And so it goes on to say, like a partridge that hatches eggs it did not lay, are those who gain riches by unjust means. When their lives are half gone, their riches will desert them, and the end they will prove to be fools. And so what, what can we conclude maybe the godless put their hope in? They put their hope in their wealth oftentimes. They put their hope in their money. They put their hope in their own abilities and schemes and well-crafted plans. And so we're not supposed to put our hopes in any of those things. It talks about in the New Testament that we are, those who are rich in the present world should not be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, but to put their hope in God who provides richly with all we need, all things we need for our enjoyment. And so ultimately God is the source of everything good we enjoy and we ought to thank him whenever life is going the way we want it to and when we're blessed, we're we're having times of prosperity and we're doing well. We should always thank God. It's one of the today's verses was uh, actually one of the, I have these Bible apps and I looked at one of today's verses and it was from uh, Deuteronomy 8 and we'll take a look. We'll take a look at this. We got to make sure we understand this principle really well because it's so important for us to realize that success is not really in our hands. It's the Lord that grants success as as John the Baptist says, no one can receive anything unless it is given to him from heaven, from above. And so, and we see James 1.17, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. And meaning that every good, true blessing we enjoy, we should thank God for and not think that our own hands have just done it for ourselves and we were just so great we just pulled this off I'm so awesome we shouldn't say stuff like that and it says and it says in Deuteronomy 8:10, when you have eaten and are satisfied praise the Lord your God for the good that he has given you be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God failing to observe his commands his laws and his decrees I am giving you today Otherwise, when you have eaten and satisfied, you will build fine houses and settle down, and your herds and flocks will grow large, your silver will increase, and all you have multiplied. Then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through this vast and dreadful wilderness, that, that thirsty and wait waterless land, with venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you... You water out of the hard rock, he gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors have never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it may go well with you. Uh, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember that the Lord your God, for he is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and confirms his covenant which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify to you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations the Lord destroyed before you. So you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord. And so what was God trying to tell them? Don't forget me. Don't forget me. Praise me for the good I do you. Remember me for the good I do you. Don't just forget me when things are going well so that you end up becoming disobedient and living for sin and idols. And so often it's not in the most difficult times that we're really tested. It's sometimes in the best times of our lives that we're really tested to forget God. And we got to really make a conscious effort to put the Lord first in those times of prosperity because I think it's more easy to seek the Lord when things are going hard, when life is bearing down on us. We always find ourselves praying more then. But, you know, the, the good thing is to remember is when we pray just as much in the times of prosperity as in the times of suffering, I think that is very, very important. And we ought to be praying in those times of prosperity that God helps incline our hearts not to forget him, not to get so fat and indulgent that we forget to do his will in the process. And so it says, and back to the, the, 
the uh, the main passage we're building upon. We're gonna say it's gonna say while it's still growing uncut. We're back to Job eight right now. They wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of those who forget God. So the so perishes the hope of the godless. What they trust is fragile, and what they rely on is a spider web. And so. You know, it's not bad to enjoy good things out of life or to have prosperous times, but, you know, we're not relying on those things. We're not putting our hope in those things. We're not, we're not forgetting God to thank Him for the good things He's done in our lives, or we should not do that. And so it says, when we forget God, that's when we start thinking it's all about ourselves, and that's where pride takes over. So such is the dis destiny of all those who forget God, so perishes the hope of the godless. For what they trust is fragile, what they rely on is a spider's web. They lean on its web, but it gives way. They cling to it, but it does not hold. They are like a well-watered plant in the sunshine, spreading its shoots over the garden. So think about a well-watered plant in the sunshine. It seems to thrive. It seems to be doing great, okay? Yeah, so, so often, we can easily do the right thing sometimes in the good times. We can easily look fresh and vibrant in the good times. But you know what really tests our faith and loyalty to God? It's when we go through a season of suffering and we still choose to remain faithful to Him. We are, uh, see, like, but not so with the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. That is uh, Psalm 1. Let's take a look at that passage real quick to give us a greater understanding of this thing, concept Job is talking about. Psalm 1 says, let's take a look. I gotta go find it real quick. Psalm 1 talks about this principle. It says, oh, here we go. We'll read it. Blessed is one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like chaff, which the wind blows away. The wicked will not stand in judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. And so... Not so are the wicked. They are like chaff which the wind blows away. When the strong winds of life and the adversity and things go really bad, that is when the wicked are most likely to bend and buckle. Those who think they have faith in God, but really are relying on a false faith in God. You know, that's what trials and testing do. It reveals the quality of our faith. It reveals where it's weak and where we need to work on it and where we actually... And sometimes, you know, trials will actually expose what our faith is truly made of. You know, when heat and fire are, are uh, heating certain elements, some of it gets burned up. Some of it, if it's gold or silver, it is purified. You can melt down gold and silver and make them more pure and more valuable doing that. But you can't do that with trash. You can't do that with wood. You can't do that with certain things. Certain things are destroyed by fire. Other things are refined by fire. And so the troubles in life will either refine us and make us more like Christ and better as a result, or they will destroy our faith or the false faith that we think we have that's real. And so we always got to make sure that the genuine, our, we have the genuine faith in Jesus Christ that we need to. Well, Jesus taught about the parable of the four soils. I'll go back to that. He there was some sowed among the thorns and the worries, and he said those are represented of those who worries and riches choke the choke the seed out so it doesn't produce a new crop then he said there's some that the Word of God is sown in them it's on shallow soil so it springs up for a time but when trials and testings come they quickly wither away because they have no root and so what Jesus is saying make sure that the root in you is truly real deep connection with the Lord God not just false superficial faith not just the type of faith that causes you to show up on in church every Sunday, but does not really change you the rest of the time. The superficial faith that will cause you to be able to sing praise songs, uh, quote Bible verses, but it has to be real within your heart if you want it to be truly something that will benefit you through life storms and trials. So we see Job was the perfect example of true faith. He went through more than any of us will ever face in a lifetime. 
yet he did not denounce God or turn his back on God. Job was the type of man who kept his faith in God and kept believing in God and God's goodness and God's rightness in spite of what he was going through. And we see, see, eventually God does do this in Job's case. Surely God does not reject the one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. Yet he will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed with shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. What happened at the end of Job's story? These friends who were accusing Job of being a faithless, godless man were the ones that were clothed in shame. Because it said God was very angry with his friends. It says God actually gave, sat them down and had a little chit-chat with them. He was not pleased. And so they were filled with shame at the end. You know, God, God had mercy on them. He didn't kill them. But he was like, you know, listen, I'm kind of ticked off at you for saying s some of the stuff you did and, you know, speaking falsely about my character, you know, because they were assuming that godly people never would go through troubled times. And that's just not true. That's a warped view of life. That's a warped view of God to say that we only get good out of life from God and we don't have to eventually at some point receive hardship. And that's, that's the false teaching that is also still pretty prevalent today. We hear people say, well, if you do the right thing, if you follow Jesus, God will bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. You know, Jesus said, in this world you will have troubles. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so we cannot falsely assume that just because we're going through difficulty, we're outside of the will of God or we do not belong to God. That's just not true. Sometimes those who follow Christ more will be will suffer even more trouble. That's that's just the bottom line. But you know what? We can have peace and joy and strength in the midst of those troubles to where we come out to the other side of those difficult times, we can bear more fruit as a result. Hope you found this message encouraging. God bless you guys.